Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second lecture of the series Lost Voices of the Holocaust. I'm Chapati Rolf Samuelson. I'm the Director of Jewish Studies here at ASU. I'm also Irving and Miriam Lowe, Professor of Modern Judaism and Regents Professor of History in the School of Historical, Philosophical and Religious Studies. So if you attended uh, the lecture uh, this past Thursday, you probably noticed that I disappeared from the screen about halfway through the program. Uh, that was caused by power outage in my neighborhood uh, here in Phoenix, and it made me miss the second half of the lecture. I finally managed to get back into the Zoom event by calling in from my cell phone but I only heard the very last musical performances or the, the last of the three performances, I guess, uh, Adam gave us. And I couldn't communicate with our wonderful lecturer, Adam Milstein. So we are indeed very, very fortunate to host Adam Milstein here for the second lecture in the series. Uh, again, you heard probably what I said on Thursday, but I'll just repeat just part of it. Milstein is an orchestral musician uh, and he has performed as a concertmaster with several regional and national symphonies, such as the Sequoia uh, Symphony, the Aspen Philharmonic Orchestra, the Baltimore Symphony, and the Louisville Orchestra. In addition, he has performed as a substitute concertmaster with the LA Opera and the LA Chamber Orchestra, and he appeared as soloist with US and international orchestras. Now, what brings Milstein to us here at ASU Jewish Studies is his interest in the recovery of the repertoire composed by Jews since the Nazis rose to power in 1933. Many Jewish composers and performers in Nazi-controlled Europe lost not only their livelihoods when they were fired from their official positions, but also they lost their lives since many of them were sent to concentra concentration camps such as Theresienstadt or Auschwitz. Some Jewish musicians in, managed, to flee to, managed to flee Europe to the United States where they had a second career here, especially in Hollywood. Yet the story of these exiled composers and the composers and musicians who perished in the Holocaust is still relatively unknown. I understand from uh, Milstein that in Europe, the situation is a little bit better, but here in the United States, I think what I said is probably accurate. Under the inspiration of Maestro James Conlon, the music director of the Colburn Conservatory in Los Angeles, Mr. Milstein became interested in the recovery of this repertoire. And uh, he is indeed the program manager of the Zering Conlon Initiative for Recovered Voices at the Colburn School in Los Angeles. On Thursday, we we'll learn from him about Mieczysław Weinberg and his fascinating career and close relationship with Dmitry Shostakovich. This evening, we're going to learn more about Erwin Schulhoff, an Austro-Czech composer and pianist whose successful career was terminated by the rise of the Nazis to power. Although he was trained as a classical musician, Schulhoff was also very interested in and influenced by jazz, as much as he was involved in the avant-garde art uh, movement of Dadaism. I should also mention that he was a communist and very interested in communism and how all that connects to each other, we're gonna hear this evening. This is not the first time ASU Jewish Studies puts together a program about Erwin Schulhoff. In 2012, we convened a research conference on reimagining Erwin Schulhoff, Viktor Ullmann, and the German-Jewish-Czech world. Mr. Milton himself is, a very committed, uh, is very committed to the recovery of Schulhoff's music since he is the curator of the project Schulhoff and More. I believe it was in 2021. And Milton organized it and performed the music of Schulhoff on filmed recordings. Some of these recordings are available in the album Shape, in the album Shape Shifter, music of Erwin Schulhoff, and this is available on the Delos label. So this evening, we're gonna learn more about Schulhoff and his involvement in modernism, be it literature, theater, painting, and above all music. Appropriately, the title of tonight's lecture is Music and Modernism, the world of Erwin Schulhoff. So, Adam, we are all ears, and the screen is yours. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Hava, again, for, for having me. It's such an honor to present, again, for uh, ASU Jewish Studies, and it's such a pleasure to be here, albeit virtually, but it's exciting uh, to talk to all of you today about Ervin Schulhoff, who is such a fascinating figure in the 20th century, 20th century, an incredibly underrated composer, um, and someone that I can't wait to delve into more today. Um, so apologies for those of you that were here on Thursday, but I just want to give a brief overview about who I am, uh, where I attend school, just to sort of orient everyone. I'm quite literally in Los Angeles right now. Uh, I'm a violinist um, at the Colburn School, which is up the street from where I am in downtown Los Angeles. And the Colburn School has multiple divisions, um, including its Community School of Performing Arts, uh, which is a pre-college division that actually has classes for all ages from early childhood through adults. I was actually part of the community school growing up where I was part of the youth orchestra and took lessons and things like that. Um, there's an elite high school division called the Music Academy. There's an elite dance academy called the Trudel Zipper Academy for dance for young emerging dancers. And I'm currently part of the conservatory. Um, the conservatory is home to about uh, 100 students college level and from undergraduate to graduate school. I'm getting my artist diploma there right now. I'm in my final year there. Um, and we're all there on full merit scholarships. Um, it's all orchestral musicians, uh, pianists, and also conducting fellows. Um, and what some makes something very unique about the Colbert School is the presence of the Zeering Conlin Initiative for Recovered Voices, which Hava just mentioned, that I'm the program manager of. And our goal is to promote and perform music by composers that were suppressed as a result of Nazi policies from 1933 to 1945. Effectively, two generations of composers were ripped out of history books by the Nazis, and we are trying to get their names and music recognized and embraced within the canon of Western art music, where they rightfully belong alongside other 20th century masters in composition. Um, it was founded by LA philanthropist Marilyn Ziering, uh, by James Conlon, who is currently the artistic director of Recovered Voices and the music director of the Los Angeles Opera, and by Robert Elias, who is the founding director of Recovered Voices. Um, there's a photo of me and Dominic, and actually you're gonna see excerpts of us playing in just a little bit. Um, so Schulhoff had a really fascinating life and his musical output embraced a large amount of aesthetic styles and schools that were right at the pulse of modernism in the 20th century. Um, I'm gonna be giving you an overview of his life throughout the course of the next hour or so uh, with musical excerpts and also excerpts of visual art, but I'm gonna be really honing in and focusing on the music from his really amazing creative output in the 1920s where he fully embraced the idiom of American jazz and ragtime into his music. He also um, was a part of the Dadaist movement in Berlin. He hung out with a lot of Dadaist um, visual artists as well at this period. Um, and then I'm going to get into just a, one work from later in his life, but our, our primary musical focus will be at the 1920s. So Schulhoff's origins, um, he was born in 1894 in Prague uh, to a German speaking Jewish family. He occupied this um, sort of outsider looking in status that was, uh, also the case of someone like Franz Kafka, who as well was a German speaking Jew um, in Prague. Um, he, from a very young age, exhibited tremendous talent at the piano. And there's a really great story that his mother um, actually went to Antonin Dvorak, the legendary Czech composer who was um, older at this period, um, supposedly rather kind of crotchety and really didn't want to hear uh, a young prodigy perform. But nonetheless, um, he was coaxed into listening to a young Schulhoff and Dvorak heard him play and saw that he was very talented, gave him a few pieces of chocolate, and then recommended that he studied at the Prague Conservatory. So the young Schulhoff, and here's a great photo of him from 1910, um, went to study piano at the Prague Conservatory until 1906. He continued his piano studies in Vienna until 1908. Um, and then he went to Leipzig and he studied with Max Reger, who was a very famous um, composer as well as pedagogue. And he was there until 1910. Then he moved to Cologne from the years of 1911 to 1914, where he studied composition, piano, and conducting. Now, during this part of Schulhoff's life, his music was incredibly influenced um, by Richard Strauss and Claude Debussy. Um, he really idolized and looked up to these composers, and that's reflected in some of his early works. There's another wonderful story where Schulhoff actually went to study with Debussy, and he did. He had, uh, as the story goes, two lessons with WC, his first and his last. So what happened was Schulhoff went in, saw the incredibly famous composer, 
they had their first lesson. He got a homework assignment, came back for his second lesson. You know, he presented WC with his work. WC looked at it and was like, what is this? You're making all these compositional errors. You're using parallel fifths and parallel octaves and things like that. And Schulhoff said to him, well, you do this all the time, to which WC responded, well, I'm Claude WC. And from that point forward, Schulhoff uh, didn't study with him anymore. He was always very rebellious, as you'll see uh, in just a few minutes. Now, the most influential and important event, um, although horrible event, in Schulhoff's younger years uh, was World War I. Um, this is a photo of him in uniform in 1917. Um, and he was conscripted into the Austrian army when he saw action on multiple fronts, um, first in Hungary in 1916. And it was here that he suffered shrapnel wound to his hand and from nervous shock. He then saw action on the Russian front in 1917. And like many other artists, intellectuals, musicians, uh, composers of his era that served in World War I, he emerged from this war completely disillusioned um, with society at large and with the philosophies and the aesthetic schools of the older generation. And that's going to come across, um, as you'll see in a few moments, um, very strongly in his music, um, in his political affiliations, um, and in the other artists that he hung out with, uh, the Dadaists at the time. Um, he becomes a committed socialist at this point when he finishes his time in World War I, and that would develop into his life into larger left-leaning um, tendencies where he becomes a, a Marxist and then a, an admirer of Soviet um, communism. Uh, in 1916, he writes in his diary that a ceremonial flood has come upon us a destructive element that threatens to annihilate all the acquired culture of European humanity. And now I stand at the portal to the land of the future, miserable and defiant. So very intense words from a young Schulhoff. Um, this is a wonderful woodcut of Schulhoff by Conrad Felix Mueller from 1924 um, over here on the right that we actually use later on uh, just a couple of years ago for our um, album on Delos, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, following the war, Schulhoff has tremendous um, shifts in his aesthetic compositions. He totally abandons the styles of Richard Strauss and Claude Debussy, who he so admired before World War I. And he decides to join his sister Viola uh, in Dresden, who is studying painting. And it was through her that he becomes introduced to the famous painter Otto Dix, um, and through him increasingly involved more and more in left-wing politics. Um, during this time, or his first years in Dresden, he's incredibly influenced by the second Viennese school, uh, which are exemplified by the composers Alban Berg, Arnold Schoenberg, and Anton Webern. Um, Schulhoff writes to all of these composers, and he actually uh, performs Berg's uh, Piano Sonata, which is a very influential piece um, in that time for him. And also in this period, around 1919, he begins organizing concerts that were inspired by new music concerts going on in Vienna, but he was doing it in Dresden, of, quote, music of the future. So he was performing his own works alongside those of Schoenberg, Berg, Webern, and also the famous modernist Alexander Scriabin, um, which I highly recommend Scriabin's work. He was a brilliant, um, fascinating pianist who totally changed the sound of music and definitely look into all of their works um, if you're able to following this, uh, this presentation. Um, through Otto Dix, who you can see here on the left, Schulhoff is, in, uh, is introduced to another very influential figure in his life, George Gross, um, and he becomes involved through them uh, with the Dada movement. Um, and Schulhoff actually organizes the first ever Dada event in Dresden, and then he moves to Berlin in 1922, and it is here that he was really influenced um, even further by the Dada styles of Gross and creates a lot of musical uh, companions or things that are inspired by Gross's uh, visual offerings um, in the Dada style. Um, in this era as well, uh, another very important thing happens, which Schulhoff is introduced to jazz music through records, to American ragtime and jazz in general um, by Gross. Gross is a huge aficionado of jazz music. Um, this becomes a really important part of Schulhoff's own musical language. He doesn't just flirt with jazz as many composers did in the 1920s. He really fully embodies jazz. And this kind of actually plays off of as well some of his beliefs in Dadaism and also I believe in socialism. He really 
considers jazz to be the music of the people and the music of the future. And you'll see that in a lot of his concert works, he would use um, instead of the traditional minuet or bore or other classical dance um, styles, which were very common uh, in classical music before World War One, he implements jazz music instead into his works, which is a reflection of Dadaism, which I'll get into in just a second. Um, this is a really wonderful uh, excerpt of Otto Dix's Metropolis, which was painted in 1927 and 1928. This is actually a triptych. Um, I highly recommend looking it up because it's a really fascinating, um, provocative uh, painting. And you can see the jazz band here in the back, and you can see the dancers and the partying. And Schulhoff uh, was very into the jazz club scene. He actually even wrote something called a hot, his Hot Sonata for saxophone and piano. Um, and he would use jazz as he improvised as well, because he was a wonderful pianist and would appear on the radio later in his life and would improvise on popular and also jazz music themes. Um, during this period, he also um, experiments with Slavonic uh, folk music and implements them into his works. And his compositions at the time were published by Universal, which is a very famous, um, prestigious publisher. Um, and although he was published and he was actively performing, he was very much the epitome of the struggling artist and was never financially secure um, really ever in, in his life. It would go in flux, but ultimately he was never very secure financially. So to give you a taste of sort of big jazz music in the style of Schulhoff, I wanted to play for you an excerpt of his Concerto for Piano and Small Orchestra um, from 1923. Uh, the third movement is entitled Allegro a la Jazz, literally Allegro in jazz. Um, and what's also great about this piece is that in typical Schulhoff ironic fashion, he calls it a concerto for piano and small orchestra. Well, as you'll see in a second, this is not a small orchestra. Um, this is a very large orchestra that also embodies a huge percussion section. And just a little bit of a inside baseball background about this piece. Um, this is from our Schulhoff and Moore project that I curated uh, during the pandemic. And you'll see that we're all wearing masks. This was either I can't, I can't remember if it was right before the vaccine came out or right when the vaccine came out, but you'll see that we're all wearing masks. We're all socially distanced at this time in order to make this happen. Um, the winds were all the way in the back of the hall. The violins and strings were all the way in the front. And uh, what else is really interesting is that we had to record the percussion completely separate because it was such a large percussion session section that with the social distancing requirements, we couldn't fit everyone in one room. So they were recorded totally separately and then using some Hollywood magic uh, properly lined up with a beat um, and mixed together. So that's kind of some fun, fun facts about this. It was quite the project putting this together. So this is Schulhoff's amazing raucous Allegro a la jazz. And you'll notice that um, the soloist Dominic Cayley uh, and myself, I'm sitting concertmaster. After all this crazy kind of partying that happens, there's this beautiful Zingaresca melody where it's a duet just between the violin and the piano, which is very rare to have happen. Um, in a concerto like this. Um, so we hope you enjoy this. And this is uh, with James Conlon conducting.
so that's easily one of my favorite uh pieces to play the 2d section of and um i also like to note that you know jazz concertos became very popular but this is written even a year before gershwin's seminal rhapsody in blue which was played in uh, 1924 so Schulhoff was always on the cutting edge of things and always very ahead of his time so it's, it's been the time sure this works ah oh, great so now I wanted to talk to you more about Dada. Um, Dadaism was born out of World War I. Uh, it was an aesthetic movement that really uh, was reactionary to the uh, aesthetic styles that existed before World War I, which, as I mentioned earlier, Schulhoff is one of these people that believe so, that the horrors, although they weren't, of course, directly caused by the aesthetic styles and philosophies of the older generations, they were emblematic of uh, the culture that existed that eventually led to the tremendous horrors of the war um, and to the tremendous death of many uh, young men on the battlefields. And uh, from the Dada Manifesto in 1918, uh, Tristan Zara wrote, what we need are strong, straightforward, precise works, which will be forever misunderstood. And some really key uh, elements of the Dada works are rejections of pre-World War I aesthetics, um, there's an emphasis of this dichotomy of old versus young, old embodying sickness, older people. Um, and there's a lot of animosity towards them because in the minds of many Dadaists and those that served in World War I, older people and older generations were responsible for sending young men into what they thought was a totally pointless war to die horrific deaths. Um, there's a use of pastiche and irony and a total rejection of past masters. And these are masters of art, philosophy, um, thought and music. Um, popular music and popular art were preferential to Dadaists to high art. So in the case of someone like Schulhoff, utilizing jazz and jazz dances was preferred to using the bore or the minuet. Um, and for visual artists, the usage of caricature was often preferred, as you'll see in just a minute in my next slides. Um, and that they created a lot of absurd uh, works because to them absurdity and art really reflected um, absurdity in life and there were tremendous also anti-war sentiments because many of these people served in World War One. Um, this is in a very harrowing example um, by Otto Dix of uh, an example of, of Dadaist anti-war art. Um, this is entitled ironically of course in memory of the glorious time and you can see here the usage of a watercolor to draw a really unflinching portrait of uh, horrible wounds um, inflicted upon soldiers in World War I. They were really making you stare at how grotesque uh, this was. And here is a caricature by George Gross of, it's called Fit for Active Service. And here you can see um, the older uh, members of the German military complex and society. Um, and the irony is of trying to say that this sort of zombified skeleton can serve in the army still as a totally absurd uh, work of lower art being a caricature. Um, I wanted to read to you a quote um, from Gross and Herzfeld, uh, which kind of also embodies this rejection of past masters, which I think is really emblematic of Dadaism. Um, they wrote that Goethe under bombardment, Nietzsche in a rucksack, Jesus in the trenches, it's all the same, whether one just blusters or gives forth with a sonnet from Petrarch, Shakespeare or Rilke, whether one gilds boot heels or carves Madonnas, the shooting goes on, profiteering goes on, hunger goes on, lying goes on. Why all that art? And here in this very intense um, caricature, blood is the best sauce, you see again, the older members of society casually enjoying uh, their, their meal while younger people get slaughtered um, in the background. Uh, and the title, of course, is very provocative. Blood is the best sauce. And Schulhoff would create his own musical responses to these types of provocations. And in the next work you're going to hear, Bas Nachtigall, it was written in 1922. And it's for Contra Bassoon, which is a large bassoon. And in here, Schulhoff actually writes um, an absurdist prologue, which is very uh, subversive and ironic, totally emblematic of Dada um, absurdity in some of his writing as well, as you'll hear in a second. Um, and then the musical offering, which I'll show you in a second, it totally rejects some of the past masters. In this case, um, Johann Sebastian Bach, the third movement of the Bach's Nachtigall, which I'll be playing for you after the prologue, 
is a fugue. A fugue, a fugue is a multi-voice um, type of composition uh, that was really utilized a lot in the Baroque era and championed by Johann Sebastian Bach. And you need an instrument that could play multiple lines or multiple voices at once. And the contrabassoon is about the opposite of an instrument that could play multiple lines at once. And it sounds ridiculous also, which is totally intentional to kind of like thumb his nose at Bach and the great masters that were writing um, before World War I. So I'm gonna start with this prologue, which is presented by William May, um, who's a bassoonist uh, in the Los Angeles opera. And then right from that, we're gonna to segue to the fugue of Bass Nachtigall, Nachtigall or Bass Nightingale. If the divine spark may be found lurking even within a sausage, then why not the double bassoon? This is therefore dedicated to poetical friends and esthetes. In short, to all hypersensitive souls as an experience. While others are swooning to the sweet tones of the violins, then take note, I always do the opposite just in order to provoke you. You petty marionettes, fops, bespectacled pseudo-intellectuals, you pathological hothouse plants and decayed expressionists, I admit without any shame to have been created out of muck and to revel in muck. But you lot, are already born with immaculately iron creases in your white tie and tails. You who merely exist. In order to keep my distance from you all, I will take a firm grasp on my monocle and I'll make you show me respect. So there's the opening provocation from Schulhoff. And now we're going to hear the fugue we have been ironically titled. So that's the boss, Snaftigal, third movement. Now, one work I wanted to draw particular attention to is the third movement of Schulhaus Fünf Pittoresken, or Five Pictures, entitled In Futura. Um, this work was written in 1919, and it's dedicated to the painter and Dadaist George Gross, as is quoted. And it actually opens with a very provocative poem by Gross. Um, this is peak Dada in the sense that Schulhoff utilizes jazz dances to create the whole work. He uses a ragtime and Maxix um, and a foxtrot. But in the middle of it, there is composed silence, which is, of course, totally absurd. Um, and actually, many people attribute John Cage with writing this first instance of uh, composed silence, 433, which is a very famous work in 1952. Well, Ervin Schulhoff always looking forward, actually wrote this all the way back in 1919. Um, I wanted to just show you, hopefully it comes up rather clearly. This is the sheet music for In Futurum. And for those of you that may read music or may not, these are all um, rests. So everything that he writes here in these like crazy time signatures, three, five over seven, 10 with the bass clef, 
on the right hand and the treble clef in the left hand. Everything is sort of backwards and crazy and totally ludicrous. He even has little smiley faces and frowny faces at the same time. He has these big quadruple fermatas. Fermatas are long held silences, which he has little exclamation points with. I mean, it's a totally ridiculous um, composition. Uh, and then it actually says in Italian, something along the, line, along the lines of those who are playing it, it must do it with all, utmost expression and sentiment and, and improvisatory style all the way until the end. So that in and of itself is ludicrous. So I'm actually wanted to play for you, uh, my friend Dominic Cayley, the wonderful pianist, his interpretation of this silent movement. So, because uh, it's really interesting to just see how a performer uh, takes it and see how absurd it is. And Dominic did a lot of work, actually, it sounds ridiculous, studying this piece. And he went through and actually tried to look, okay, where is my right hand supposed to be? Where's my left hand supposed to be? Where are these big pauses and silences? So if we're going to start with the ragtime movement, which is the second movement, and that's going to go right into the infuturum.
they get a good sense of that. I love that. I, <laughs> that was just a laugh. Dominic, I think he did a really good job. He very much committed. I think he did that in one take. So, you know, it's a lot harder than it looks <laughs> to do a movement of silence. Um, the next piece I wanted to show to you today um, are excerpts from his five pieces for string quartet. Um, for me, this is the embodiment of multiple levels of Dadaist um, thinking. Uh, Schulhoff here utilizes pastiche in the sense that he creates uh, five short vignettes in this work that are not necessarily connected um, sonically or even thematically. Um, he also uses uh, popular styles of dance, but sort of reinterpreted through his lens. Um, and the first movement in and of itself is completely ironic. He writes uh, in, a, in the style of a Viennese waltz, which the Viennese waltz is usually super elegant and it's always in three, four. So it's in one, two, three, one, two, three. And Schulhoff being Schulhoff writes it in cut time. One, two, one, two, which is like never done. Um, very absurd. So I want to play for you the first um, three movements, short movements of his five pieces for string quartet. Um, his Vals Viennese have Serenata. The second movement is kind of uh, reminiscent of Bartokian kind of night music. Uh, and then uh, the third movement is a la Cheka. It's in the style of a Czech um, folk song. So these are the first three movements of his five pieces.
has to be one of my all-time favorite things to perform and as you can tell this was height of the pandemic also pre-vaccine this one we were totally spread out we actually had to rehearse this in my parents garage because it was like partially outdoors and we were masked and it was a whole process so the fact that we could even play together was an accomplishment in and of itself and let alone play more or less in unison being so spread out when usually you're like one foot across from each other we were about like at least 15 feet across this way and anyway quite the process but we're very happy with how it's how it ultimately turned out. Um, the next piece excerpt I wanted to play for you is from Schulhoff's second sonata for violin and piano. Um, it's a burlesque, it's a burlesque movement. Uh, this is another example of Schulhoff utilizing popular dance forms, in this case, the more erotic burlesque in the context of a more high art sonata um, setting. Uh, this, These are actually pictures that I took of Schulhoff's original manuscript. Um, there's a signature down there of the violin sonata and of this burlesque movement um, in summer of 2022, um, which was like, yeah, 2022, um, I went to Prague actually, and I visited uh, the Czech National Museum of Music and I got to um, take scans actually of a bunch of Schulhoff's original manuscripts and hold them in my hands, which was like such a tremendous experience. Um, so anyway, these are two actual photos of Schulhoff's original manuscript. Um, and this is his uh, burlesque movement. Thank you. 
very challenging, virtuosic movement, but and a lot of fun to play as well. Um, so now onto the later part of Schulhoff's life. Um, he worked as a music critic of the Prager Abendblatt, uh, and which is a German uh, paper, and he wrote a lot of uh, essays in German. But however, he really never felt totally welcomed by either the German speaking or the Czech speaking communities. Um, and in the 30s, he was actually performed and his music was performed all over Europe, and, uh, including a uh, performance of the Concerto Cabal Orchestra, which is a very prestigious orchestra in Amsterdam, where he played as soloist in his own double concerto. And there's a picture here from around today of the Royal Concerto Cabal Orchestra. Um, his compositions were regular fe regularly featured at festivals of the International Society for Contemporary Music, which was a, which was a prestigious, prestigious showcasing of um, contemporary music from Europe. Um, and he also performed very frequently on the Prague radio uh, from 1930 to 35 in these semi-improvised popular music and jazz broadcasts. Um, there's actually a really amazing um, CD available of the only recordings that exist of Schulhoff playing Schulhoff from these sessions at the Prague radio. And there's also um, a Mozart recording on there as well. But if you can track it down, uh, you can find the CD of Schulhoff playing Schulhoff. Um, during this period, he also makes a shift to more socialist realism. He goes, politics go further and further to the left. He joins the Czech left front in 1931, which is like a theater troupe. He goes to the Soviet Union in 33, and he organizes a competition and concertizes all over the Soviet Union. And he begins really writing in the socialist realist style. The biggest embodiment of this, besides some of his more politically charged symphonies, is that he actually sets the whole communist manifesto to music as an oratorio. Um, so it doesn't get more socialist realist uh, than that composition of it. Um, in his final years, uh, Schulhoff, following the Nazi occupation of the Czech lands in 1938 and 39, realizes that his life is doubly endangered because he's both Jewish and also a communist. Um, he tries unsuccessfully to emigrate to the U.S., Britain, and France, but he eventually um, receives citizenship for himself and his family uh, for the Soviet Union, and he gets this in April of 1941. Um, he gets his visa to go to the Soviet Union on June 13th of 41, um, but unfortunately waits a little too long. And at this point, the Nazis invade the Soviet Union on June 22nd, and Schulhoff is arrested um, as an enemy alien uh, the next day. He's actually held at the YMCA in Prague uh, with his son uh, as a Soviet citizen. And then he's actually eventually sent to a concentration camp in Würzburg, Bavaria. Um, he dies here at this concentration camp of tuberculosis in 1942. Um, his son ends up, Pete, his son Peter Shulhoff ends up uh, surviving the war and becomes a rather prominent um, Czech new wave uh, filmmaker. Um, and thus the Nazis cut short this remarkably um, talented composer and his music never really got fully uh, accepted as it should, although it saw some success um, his more socialist, realist, realist works in Czechoslovakia um, during uh, the Soviet years because he wrote so much music that was really um, communist forward. Um, but other than that, it was hidden in the Iron Curtain and it hasn't really been um, as recognized as it should, especially in the West. Um, this is a photo of the concentration camp where he died in Würzburg, Bavaria. I actually took this photo and the next series of photos that you'll see, um, as I mentioned, uh, in the summer of 22, uh, 2022. Um, I was performing Schulhoff's music and Weinberg's music actually in Italy at a festival. And then I went to Prague where I visited Schulhoff's archives. I also went to Theresienstadt, um, the infamous uh, concentration camp outside of Prague. And then I went on a journey um, by myself via train from Prague all the way to Berlin um, through uh, Vienna where I visited Dachau um, and Salzburg. And then I went to Nuremberg. And from there I visited this concentration camp where Schulhoff died. Um, which is uh, actually an old fortress. Um, and following that, I went up to Berlin. Now, it was a very intense couple of weeks, um, but very important and eye-opening and really just uh, was a transformative moment of my life to be able to go to these locations. Um, and this is uh, inside of the concentration camp. Uh, this is actually a statue that was erected there um, in Würzburg in the fortress. Here's a closer look. It says Erwin Schulhoff, Erwin Schulhoff composer and pianist, and gives his um, birth and death uh, dates. And this is another look into the uh, fortress. Let's give you a sense. And then I actually um, tracked down 
where he was buried. He was buried amongst uh, a bunch of uh, uh, Soviet um, soldiers, actually, uh, because this was a concentration camp for enemy aliens and Soviet citizens that were forced to do um, hard labor there. And this is actually uh, um, it's a memorial for fallen um, Soviet soldiers uh, that died there in Würzburg. And uh, it took me a while to figure out where this was. None of it was really marked. I had to dig deep online to even find sort of coordinates. And then I trekked by myself through these Bavarian backwoods for a few miles and hiking with all my stuff. And I finally found it. Um, it was a very moving experience because um, you can see on the left here, there's this big, beautiful um, assortment of flowers in this bush. And there is where Schulhoff's grave is. And this is actually his grave. Um, so that uh, concludes, oh, almost concludes my presentation. Um, to shamelessly uh, self-promote a bit, this is um, the album artwork for the Shapeshifter album, which came out on the Delos label um, of a lot of these recordings that we made at Colburn of Schulhoff's music. And here's a copy of it here. So if you're interested, uh, I definitely recommend checking it out. It's also available on Spotify and different streaming platforms. Um, and I wanted to uh, just end today um, with final work uh, that was written by Schulhoff in 1937. Um, this is during a period where he was writing a lot of more socialist realist things, um, but this is a really beautiful um, jazz uh, foxtrot that really took a look back to the golden period of the 1920s and just emblematic of the beauty and the grace with which um, Schulhoff wrote. Um, a really remarkable composer, and I hope that you can dig more into his work. So to end today, this is Schulhoff's Susie.
So thank you all um, so much for being here today. And I also just want to make one mention as well. There's a really wonderful article uh, that's a great source of information um, that I referenced today um, by Yoel Greenberg, which was written in 2014, called Parables of the Old Men and the Young, the Multifarious Modernisms of Schulhoff's String Quartet. So if you want to learn more, I highly recommend that article as well, uh, as it goes really into data, et cetera. So anyway, that's all for the presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Adam. This was fabulous. Uh, I'm dying to pose a question since I also don't see any any questions in the Q and A. So please put your questions if you have. But I'm I'm really intrigued by the kind of the two parts of his life. So can you explain a little bit more the connection between being Jewish in Prague and in Berlin? and being attracted to modernism. Mm. What exactly is going on? Is it part of the producers, part of the consumers, part of the, what exactly does modernism mean to him or signify to him? That's question number one. The question number two is the opposite. Why in the thirties is he falling in love, so to speak, with socialism, even communism and this realist style? Somehow that move, unless you can explain it psychologically, it, it, it doesn't really make an obvious sense. So mm -hmm. if you can explain that situation. Yeah, I could try to take a crack. I mean, especially the, the first question is interesting because Schulhoff um, didn't really embrace his religion. He was very secular. And uh, as he got you know more involved with the Dada as a particular and more of a communist, he fully rejected uh, a lot of religion. But that being said, I think that something that's interesting is the fact that he was part of this uh, minority, so to speak, of being a German-speaking Jew in Prague, and especially in a place where there were these two factions of German speakers and, and Czechs, and because he never really felt fully embraced by either, I think that um, he really turned to a lot of these modernist aesthetic trends because it was kind of a reflection, perhaps, of his own sort of self being a rebel constantly, the fact that he was always at odds and, and othered in that society. I feel like modernism was a natural draw for him to totally reject the status quo of what was happening, um, compositionally speaking, and really cozy up incredibly with 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 the rebels and the you know enfant terrible, if you will, of of the times. So I feel like modern modernism is a natural sort of aesthetic choice. I don't know if the religious elements of Jewishness had much of an impact on him, but the societal elements of being constantly othered, I think, could have contributed that um, embrace of modernism. And then, I mean, when World War One happened and he came out just so dis disillusioned. Um, and got so involved with um, committed communists. I mean, he just got deeper and deeper into communism. He was always for the people. And I feel like his modernist tendencies to embrace music of the people like jazz music, like these types of dances, actually kind of plays into some of his political leanings and ideologies. And by embracing things that were so um, counter- capitalist in the sense that he was loved going to small jazz clubs and intimate venues where jazz was performed a lot like that I think could have actually influenced uh, his further embrace of, of, of uh, communism and this music of the people which he then really put into his own uh, musical compositions and eventually ended up kind of rejecting a lot of jazz when it started to fall out of favor um, in, in uh, performance and embracing this socialist realism he just felt became completely enamored with communism and socialist realism as he just got more and more involved in the political left and a lot of her, his uh, artistic friends were very committed communists and he was definitely influenced by them and just sort of had that shift for for whatever reason he's got more and more radical <laughs> well maybe he's looking for redemption in a sense kind of he's looking for a solution to the human condition and socialism is one one solution or one okay. pretension you know pretended solution or whatever definitely. okay Let's see if we have other questions. If you can, go, can you go to the Q and A, or do you want me to read it to you? Can you see the Q and A? I can see it. I... Here, I'll I'll do it, Hava, if you want. Oh yeah, that'd be great, Lisa, if you could. Yeah. Okay. Um. So uh, David Cater said, um, "I suppose my question that I raised in the chat, he he was commenting a lot in the chat, is simply." How do we get his music programmed into the contemporary national and regional symphonies? That would really permit his rediscovery. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, um, 
as a pr actively performing violinist and my friend Dominic, also the pianist that's featured prominently in this, we are actively programming Schulhoff and encouraging his programming alongside other great 20th century masters and also masters of, of, of classical music. Schulhoff followed in line with other recognized names. Um, he was a student of, uh, he loved the music, not a student of, but he loved the music, for example, of Janacek as well, who was a great Czech composer. And I think it's really integral to pair Schulhoff with things that make sense aesthetically that audiences are already aware of. So even doing a very natural connection between Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue and Schulhoff's Piano Concerto that features jazz. Both works have jazz elements treated in different ways. Schulhoff's is his interpretation of, of American jazz via records. Gershwin is his own lived experience in American jazz. And I feel like those kind of uh, comparisons are really interesting for audience members. So I hope to see Schulhoff programmed alongside other just recognized um, compositional uh, talents and geniuses that people are more familiar with. Because I think that's a great entry point for people to be exposed to the music of Schulhoff. So Dominic and I are trying to do, do that ourselves in our personal lives and spread his music to a lot of different musicians and audiences. I would like to comment also that Dominic actually played um, Schulhoff in Carnegie Hall last year, uh, which is a great accomplishment to have him performed in Carnegie Hall and get recognized in that way. So we're trying to get it out there as, as, as much as possible, but I totally agree. It's, we need to get his music more and more recognized. You want to do the next one, Hava? You see where we are? Or you want me to do Yeah, it? so we have another request from you. Can you write out the name of the article you cited? Oh, yes. With more information about Schulhoff? I can do that. Maybe after the other question, I'll remember to do that. I'll put it in the in the chat. Is that? Is and that then right? the, fi the uh, following question is from Viktor Aronoff. Is the Communist Manifesto available as a recording? Yes, yeah, you can look it up on YouTube. Look up Ervin Schulhoff, Communist Manifesto, and his oratorio will, will come up. So definitely check it out. There's a lot of this music that's out there and has been recorded. It's just a matter of people knowing about it and, and listening to it, yeah. So who is the other Jewish in his in milieu in, uh, in, in the church? you know, just Slovakia, is the other, other other Jews that would be similar to him or close enough for not not writers, but musicians that, that we should know about? Yeah, in the chat, well, I don't know actually if Schulhoff spent time with him, but you could look into Victor Ullmann. Um, yeah, okay, Ullmann, yes. Yes, Jewish um, composer who actually wrote very famously um, in um, Theresienstadt. Um, there's, this, there's this group of composers that are generally grouped together that were in Terezin, which is of course the concentration camp outside of Prague. Um, Gideon Klein is also interesting um, to look into as well. Um, and so is Hans Krasse, I would, I would check out for uh, German speaking composers that end up in, ended up in, in Terezin. Um, in Schulhoff's own cultural milieu, I mean, I know, for example, when he was talking to the second Viennese school people, he had very extensive conversations with, uh, in, in, via letters, of course, with Alban Berg, um, and different members of the second Viennese school that um, Schoenberg was was Jewish and Schulhoff talked to him, but obviously they weren't living um, in Prague. So I say I would say from this sort of recovered voices type of composer in that area, I would say uh, Victor Ullmann, Gideon Klein, um, and Hans Krasser would be a great place to look as well. Yeah, and we in the conference that we did uh, here in 2012, we we uh, refer to all of them. But I have another question that maybe it's a little bit. Uh, I don't know, far-fetched. I was thinking that if, how shall I put it nicely? If these composers were alive, would we have had postmodernism? Because th there's so much of postmodernism is already here. In other words, you don't need postmodernism. This is the music or this is the culture or the thinking that you are part of. Right. Maybe it's the Holocaust and the break with that chunk of repertoire that 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 part uh which makes post-world war ii music and post-world war ii uh, post-modernism possible does that make sense that does no, that's a really actually i've never thought about it that way but that's the i want to i want to think about that more before i can even yeah, think, think that, about, yeah. that's a great that's a great question though but i think that's a because really they have everything that we we take for granted in post-modernism they already had it in the 30s or in the 20s even right Right. But then, then it's 
out of the story, right? The Nazis excise it from the story of what we are, what Western culture and music is all about. And then we kind of rediscover a new way of being post post World II, right. World War II, right? right? But in fact, what postmodernism is doing is not so different from what these people were doing. No, that's no, that's a great point. And, and I mean, with Schulhoff in particular, you can see just how how forward thinking he was. I mean, that example with um, him writing "Composed Silence" in 1919, over 30 years before John Cage did it. But John Cage is the one that's always credited with being this great innovator for 433. It was like, well, actually, you know. <laughs> this happened decades before in the case of Shulhoff, but as you said, it was totally ripped ripped from it's history. Yeah, 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 it's a great point. I, another thought in the first piece that you sh that you shared with us, I'm not sure it's a concerto, I think. Oh yes, that's right. Um, it starts in a very urban environment, right? The noise, the the the, the rhythm, everything is boom, 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 and then there is this peaceful part. That to me is Jewishness. Is that fair to say? That's kind of a, the, the melodies, the, but you hear is a very Jewish soul in a sense, in yeah. a very hustle and bustle of the of the urban environment. No, definitely, it's like him sort of reaching a sense of solace. And I always picture that as an urban environment, but also he loved going to jazz clubs and partying and being all night playing the piano at, at various bars. And I, for me, that's almost like. The party dies down a little bit as well. And he's just there. Him and one other musician are hanging out. They're performing. They're improvising. Then all of a sudden the door opens back up again and they're they're thrown back into this club kind of environment. That's how I always interpret it as well. You know, it's a, okay. it's a awesome. lovely moment that's super rare in the third movement of a concerto. It's, a you know, that almost never happens to have that kind of stall and this like spotlight that's then shifted to the, the violinist and the pianist and this intimate kind of duo with such a gorgeous melody. Um, amidst all that chaos it's a it's a wonderful thing and also sort of a modernistic element as well too to even think to incorporate something like that is super um groundbreaking in that in that context another thing i should note too is that that concerto is is performed in one movement it's all a taka um and there's all these great cadenza that happens and these improvisatory elements it's a really i highly recommend checking out um that whole recording of his second piano concerto because it's quite the journey and a very unique work um, Ravel does something similar with his left hand concerto, but um, this is it, it's, it's its own thing, totally. I see we have another question in the Q and A. Uh, oh no, that's already what we had before. That's about the uh, writing out the name of the article. Oh yeah, let me do that before I forget into the chat. Yeah, you you do it you do it now. And and my last question would be to you about the project as a whole. Is, are you focusing just on the composers or also on performers and on the music, uh, kind of the business of music uh, that Jews took major part in? So how do you how do you uh, frame the, the project? Um, so the, the project at Colburn, um, we focus um, solely on the, the, co the composers and their compositions. Like that's our, our main priority is to perform the works of these um, suppressed composers, uh, most of which were Jewish, some of which were not. Um, the example of, for example, uh, Ernst Krenick was was exiled because of his political ideologies, and there's other examples of that as well. But we really focus on these works and trying to get them into to the concert hall. Um, of course, sometimes different performers and, and uh, come into conversation when we sort of present uh, this music, but often we're, we're strictly focused on the performance of these composers and their works. All right, wonderful. Well, I see a lot of stuff in the chat, so I don't know if you have access, if you can look at it and you'll find some uh, thing you want to relate to, but if not, you have a lot of thank you notes from oh, all you, your admirers here, <laughs> and a lot of people ordered CDs. And... Oh, good. Oh, my goodness. That's fantastic. <laughs> Whatever you time, recommend. Let me know. <laughs> Wonderful. So this is really terrific. And just to show us the richness of Jewish culture uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and how most of us are really not familiar with it, unfortunately, but there's so much creativity going on here. And all this creativity, of course, was shattered by the Holocaust. So uh, we have to think out of what has Western... Uh, culture lost. It's not just life, it's all this incredible creativity.
So with that in mind, we're going to thank you and wish you all a good evening and hope to see you in our next um, program.